Hi, I'm Dustin Kirkland, and I'm here with Saad Ali, tech lead at Google for storage in Kubernetes. And we're going to talk a bit about maybe your views on some of the big problems left to solve in the Kubernetes uh, technical arena. Sure, yeah. So uh, SIG Storage has been dealing with a bunch of different uh, issues, most recently around making Kubernetes storage more extensible. Um, so we authored the Container Storage Interface Project uh, with the goal of making volume plugins external to Kubernetes. Okay. Uh, the challenge so far has been, you know, Kubernetes, we've developed a very powerful volume uh, subsystem. Uh, but in order to add new volume plugins, you have to actually check code into the Kubernetes core code base. Hmm. Uh, and that's extremely painful for, for us as Kubernetes developers uh, because we have to maintain and test code that we don't write, uh, and we don't necessarily have all the external dependencies to be able to test it properly. And it's painful for storage vendors because they have to align themselves with a Kubernetes release and they right. have to open source code that they may not be comfortable open sourcing. So this should accelerate a bit of the portability of the storage layer for Kubernetes. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And what about ensuring, can it do that while still ensuring API compatibility? Um, that is the goal. So one of the reasons we didn't want to uh, come up with an interface early on was it's very difficult to predict what you what the the, the user usage patterns are going to look like. Mm -hmm. And so uh, initially we we built everything in tree. We could iterate on it very quickly. Um, if we broke a volume plugin because we wanted to modify the API, we could go ahead and update those volume plugins that were all in tree. Uh, now we've gotten to a point where we understand what the, the, the interface should look like, and we've gotten to a point where we can actually go ahead and uh, uh, create an interface, uh, an API that uh, is going to fulfill our needs. Right. So um, the API is separate, of course, from the implementation. The but the API, you feel like, is pretty well set at this point. Uh, it's still evolving. So we haven't gone to 1.0 yet. Okay. And the reason for that is because we want to give ourselves the ability to continue to evolve it. Uh, until we're confident in it. So with Kubernetes, we went beta last quarter. Mm -hmm. And uh, next uh, quarter, where we're going to keep it in beta, and then the, the quarter after that, we plan to move it uh, into GA. When we move it to GA, we want to move the interface to 1.0. Is this a uh, problem that you look to make some progress on, perhaps, this week at the Contributor Summit or over the course of the, the conference? Yeah, absolutely. It'll be interesting to talk to uh, developers, especially in the storage arena, uh, who are actually writing volume plugins, uh, and get their feedback on, on uh, the, the interface as it exists today. Hmm. And this interface has, so far in your experience, it's been portable across clouds and on-prem as well? Yes. Uh, the idea with uh, the volume plugin is that no matter what kind of storage system, whether it is a cloud storage system, could be GC persistent disks, Amazon EBS disks, or on-prem if you're running something like NFS, iSCSI or Ceph, any Ceph yep. um, you can write a volume plugin and it'll just work. And as far as your end users of Kubernetes are concerned, it's abstracted away from them so they don't have to worry about the, the actual storage that's fulfilling their workloads uh, storage needs. Um, do you have a, a perspective perhaps on uh, maybe some of the ways that uh, Kubernetes is helping with storage at scale, um, large scale? Yeah, so I think one of the challenges in the past has been that storage uh, requires the end user to be intimately aware of the type of storage system that they're using. Sure. And with Kubernetes, uh, one of the cool things it's done is it has abstracted away things like compute, memory, but also storage. Hmm. Uh, at least for file and block, an end user no longer has to worry about the specific implementations of their uh, storage, where it comes from, how it's going to scale, they can just assume that it exists. Mm -hmm. And Kubernetes will make sure that it's available wherever their workload is scheduled and move around with it wherever right. their workload is scheduled. And then what about the cross-section of the hard problems around storage and networking, right? Much of the storage is network attached, right? So yes. you've, you've clearly got to have uh, a tight correlation with the storage, uh, the, the storage SIG and the network SIG have to be pretty tightly correlated, right? Yes. Uh, a lot of the magic that comes uh, from being able to move your workloads around with your storage is be due to the fact that the storage is actually network attached. Mm -hmm. um, that does come at a cost if you, your network is, your storage is going over your network, your network uh, and your network constraint, it can, can cause issues. Sure. 
Uh, unfortunately, in Kubernetes, we don't do a great job of um, uh, being able to uh, partition out your, your network I.O. So, Saad, you've mentioned SIG storage a couple of times now, and uh, it sounds like you're in the a leadership position around the SIGs and have, have been around that. Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about how the special interest groups work in the, in the CNCF and around Kubernetes and maybe some best practices you've learned in, sure. in working with that. Yeah, so the uh, special interest groups in Kubernetes are designed to kind of break this very, very large project into more manageable chunks. Uh, trying to manage a project uh, the size of Kubernetes, an open source project where you don't have hierarchy, you don't have you know folks who are in charge of large groups, is very difficult. Mm. And so with uh, the special interest groups, uh, what we've tried to do is uh, create areas of interest uh, where you could have developers focused on a specific area of Kubernetes. So for example, I work with SIG storage and we're responsible for the volume subsystem of Kubernetes. And if someone wanted to get involved in your SIG or another SIG, what's that process look like? Yeah. So we uh, hold bi-weekly meetings, uh, at least in the storage SIG side, and all the other SIGs also have meetings uh, that they hold regularly and the schedules are published uh, on, on the website. Uh, and we know that folks all over the world can't necessarily attend no matter what time you're going to pick. There's going to be a time zone that isn't going to work for people. Sure. So we encourage all SIGs to actually record and publish these uh, meetings so that if you're in a time zone that can't attend or for whatever reason you can't attend, you can catch up on uh, what's going on with the SIG. Good, good. That's great. Yeah, so it's a really interesting community, this Kubernetes community. I'm curious if you have any any thoughts on uh, particular community members that maybe you want to give a shout out to people that have helped you or inspired you in the you know in the last few months. Um, so I guess one of the uh, really awesome developers I've been working with recently is Vladimir Vivian. Uh, he used to be uh, with the Dell EMC code team. He's now with VMware. Uh, still working on Kubernetes, uh, specifically the Container Storage Interface project. Uh, I'm super impressed with his knowledge of the Go language, uh, gRPC, and just how personable he is. He works remotely from Florida, but he's always available uh, to answer questions and, and willing to help fix bugs and uh, gnarly design issues. Part of that globally distributed community that, that we're all a part of. Here. Exactly. Well, thanks, Saad. Cool. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you.